the epistle is taken from St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 12. Brethren, you know that when you were Gentiles, you went to dumb idols, according as you were led. Wherefore, I give you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God says, Anathema to Jesus. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except in the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of ministries, but the same Lord. There are varieties of workings, but the same God, who works all things in all. Now the manifestation of the Spirit is given to everyone for profit. To one through the Spirit is given the utterance of wisdom, to another the utterance of knowledge, according to the same Spirit, to another faith in the same Spirit, to another the gift of healing in the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the distinguishing of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another interpretation of tongues. But all these things are the work of one and the same Spirit, who divides to everyone according as he will. Please stand for the Holy Gospel. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ is taken from St. Luke, chapter 18. At that time, Jesus spoke this parable also to some who trusted in themselves as being just and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and began to pray thus within himself, O God, I thank thee that I am not like the rest of men, robbers, dishonest, adulterers, even like this publican. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I possess. But the publican standing far off, who had not so much as lift up his eyes to heaven, but kept striking his breast, saying, O God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I tell you, this man went back to his home justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself shall be humbled, and he who humbles himself shall be exalted. Please be seated. Dear servers, dear faithful, a few announcements for this Sunday. First of all, next Sunday is our consecration day for all of you who have been preparing doing your preparation for the total consecration to our Lord Jesus Christ through the Blessed Virgin Mary, according to Louis de Montfort. So we will have this consecration at the end of Mass on Sunday, August 16th. On that Sunday, for this consecration, I would like to have benediction of the Blessed Sacrament. It is always best to do our consecration in front of the Blessed Sacrament, and we have not had benediction for a few weeks, even a couple months now, and it's something important occasionally to be able to do here in the mission and for all of you to be blessed by the Blessed Sacrament. So we'll do that next Sunday with the consecration to make it extra special as we consecrate ourselves to the Sacred Heart of Jesus or our Lord Jesus Christ through Mary. And speaking of that, we have this last week. This week that we are preparing for the consecration is our week to know Jesus Christ. Even if you haven't been so faithful, maybe you've missed a few prayers or even been negligent on a few days, that doesn't matter so much. If you're willing to make this last week count, remember that the consecration is about this, knowledge of Jesus Christ. We want to be united to Him. We want to be close to Him. So use this time well, this last week, to prepare for this consecration. Now, some of you may be new coming to the Mass. That's all right. Do this week well you can make that consecration with us. If you prefer to wait for another time and do all 33, that's certainly total, totally up to you. You're free to do so. You'd like to be better prepared. It is quite a powerful devotion, and one that I told you once before, if we really want to make a change in the world, and we really want to make a good novena, this is the way to do it. 33 days of preparation to make a consecration to Our Lady so that we're united to our Lord.
I encourage you to take a look at the FSSPX dot today online bulletin. There's not a lot of information there, but I try to keep the Sunday mass schedule up to date for the mission here. So you can always know the mass time there if there's any change. Normally we're pretty steady at 4 p.m. Not real any real change for many, many months. But always the confessions follow before mass. So we start confessions at least by three, but I've been starting earlier and so have the other priests in order to give a good hour of confessions. So if you want to be certain to get into confession, you might want to be one of those first ones here. So get here at 3 and get ready to make your confession by 3.15 and you're certain to get in. But a lot of times I cannot get to those last few who came in the last 10 minutes. So today, if there's anyone who needs a critical confession, I will leave that up to you whether that's mortal or venial, but then I will be there to hear them. I'm not going to offer to hear confessions for any great length of time because I have other meetings to do with some of you. But if anybody would really needs to go to confession this weekend, I will hear your confession. Otherwise, please come on time next Sunday. Also, I can do some blessings after Mass, um, but I may end up with more confessions. We may end up having to do one month schedule, meaning like one Sunday I do extra confessions after Mass, another Sunday doing blessings, and another Sunday doing meetings. We were doing some of that before we moved out of the mortuary chapel. We may have to get back to that just to make things run a little smoother and less hectic. So keep in mind that that might be the schedule. I will notify you through email or through this bulletin if that's the case. The coordinator will let you know. Speaking about that, it's critical if you're going to be attending Mass regularly at St. John Bosco Mission that you register. At least let us know your email so we can notify you of Mass times and of any critical notices. Some of you are not on the email list. So I'm afraid you do not get the updates. So if you're wanting the updates and you want to be part of the regular schedule, please give us your contact info. You can speak to the coordinator Arlene Pereso. I thank Father Harbour, who filled in for me next last weekend. As many of you know, there's something very similar about us, and that is the top is going thin. Otherwise, he's quite a few years, well, a few years older in the priesthood than myself. And so I hope that he'll be able to come down and pay you an occasional visit, maybe even the other priests, as we hope to rotate our schedules every few months so you get a chance to see the other priests. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. What a beautiful Sunday, the readings, the Epistle, and the Gospel. The follow after this feast of John Marie Vianney, the Curie of Ars, patron saint of priests, the parish priests. And why is it so beautiful, or why is there this connection? And it's here. Brethren, you know that when you were Gentiles, you went to dumb idols, according as you were led. And then in the Gospel, we hear about the publican and the Pharisee. And there's something the Pharisee must have forgotten, that he was a sinner too. And St. Gregory says that if we leave out one thing, we may do everything well. I mean, almost. But there's a few things we don't. We're not so perfect at, or maybe we're very sinful at, then it puts us in the camp of the Pharisee. To think ourselves doing, oh, I'm so much better than the rest of men, but yet we're not perfect in everything. We're like the Pharisee. And so that's where I mean to tie it into the Curie of Ars, is that the Curie of Ars was very concerned for souls. And he knows that souls often run after dumb idols. And he knows that sometimes souls aren't saying they're sorry and going to confession as they should. And they stand up amongst other men and think themselves very exalted and make themselves very proud. And 
they forget that pride is also a vice. The Pharisee said, I'm not like the rest of men, robbers, dishonest, adulterers, but he should have added pride. Could he have said, I'm not proud like the rest of men? Even he knew he couldn't. But that was his vice. And pride is the vice that's at the root of all vices. We know there's seven of them. And rather than listing them so you forget, I'll just tell you that pride is one of the seven, but it's at the root of all the other six. So really, the Pharisee was worse than the publican. So I tell you this, and I draw your attention to these readings, and I draw your attention to the Kiri of ours because this is very critical to us as Catholics. We need the sacrament of penance. We need to be humble and ask for God's mercy. And unless we're like the Blessed Virgin Mary, conceived without sin and pure of heart, we are not so much greater than the rest of men. We have to work at it, work at it. So I wish to direct this sermon today, thinking about the Curie of ours, what he was trying to do in his village. I wish to direct this sermon towards you men, mainly towards the men. All of you will gain something from the sermon, I hope. But I'm going to pray a Hail Mary now, because I wish her, her blessing to be upon this sermon. And then I'm going to address this primarily to the men. Hail Mary, for the grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Dear men, we are weak. Now I know there are very strong men in the world, but they seem to be far and in between. We are weak. This week, the priest is reading about the life of all those special persons in the fourth book of Kings. We read today about Jezebel about Jehu and Jezebel. Jezebel was a princess or queen married to Achab. And she was very wicked. She brought a lot of apostasy and worship of false idols and worse things into the nation, God's chosen people, into Israel. She just did some horrible things against the priests of our dear God. She even murdered them. So at the end of her time, when things were looking very dire, General Jehu was entering the city victorious. She made herself up very pretty and stood at the window to make an impression upon him. And he looked up and said, who's that? Throw her down. He knew who she was. And the eunuchs, her servants, threw her into the street at his command. The horses trampled on her. And they left her in the street. He went in to celebrate the victory. He said, you know what? Go out and collect this Jezebel because she is the daughter of a king. She deserves to be buried. And all they found was a skull in the ends of her hands because she'd been eaten by the dogs. Just judgment of God for her wickedness and her apostasy and worse. So I bring her story forward because it's part of our readings that we read in Matthews, our scripture readings each morning because it applies to us men. And so maybe you'll never forget this phrase. Get rid of your Jezebels, dear men. We all have them. Things that are made up very pretty, very attractive, capture the heart of men, trick him into sin, and even apostasy from God. What are your Jezebels, dear men? Get rid of your Jezebels. Get rid of your Jezebel if it's one. So recently I was reading, and I think it's very important to bring forward to you some quotes from a book, which at the moment I won't mention the title because I want to be certain to read the whole book through before suggesting it to you to read. But what I've read so far is very powerful and good. And it's about bringing back masculinity to men. And this is a traditional Catholic man. He writes this book because he wants others, other men especially, to know what he knows, to learn what he learned, to be good men, to be masculine. But to be masculine requires a spiritual life. 
It means getting rid of those Jezebels. It means going to confession. It means reforming oneself. And he was writing this book and he says at the very beginning, I had so many obstacles because the devil didn't want me to say these things. The devil's very wily. He likes to have us lay in a stupor so that we fall and maybe lulled to sleep or just okay with the things that are our Jezebels, our faults, our vices. We get mesmerized by them. And he knows this, the devil. So this man writing the book, he had a lot of obstacles. And he said, whoever reads this book and tries to put these practices in place in his life, these implementation of practices, he said, you're going to run up against the devil. The devil's going to bother you. It's so true. Whenever you try to do good away from your bad, the devil tries to stop you. At least he tries to say, you're unworthy. You can never change. You'll never do anything good. He always tries to discourage us or keep us in our sins. So this man writes, and I'll quote just a couple things from him, but primarily what he's saying is, I don't want you to read this book, and if you're starting to read this book, there's a few things you need to do first. The first thing, well, at least one of the first things, is you must get rid of bad images bad images, all of them. And it's important for me to say that because I know as a priest in the modern world and hearing confessions for 18 years that one of the primary faults for us is what we take in through our eyes that dictates how we think in our imagination and even our feelings and pleasure. It is the electronics around us that are so, so divisive and so strong upon us. He even goes, goes so far to say in this very beginning part of the book that if you can't handle the device and it's causing you to sin, throw it out. So I challenge you today, any one of you, if you want to bring me your cell phone or your computer because you know it's taking in the sin, I'll receive it and I'll throw it out. That's how serious it is. We gamble with our eternal salvation. Is that worth it? No, it's not. If you can't handle something that's too hot, what do you do with it? Drop it. If you have a two, I don't know, anything, take anything in life. Anything, it's just beyond your talent, beyond your strength. You don't mess with it. It's not your game. So the same with these things. I say a cell phone, I say a computer, maybe it's something else. It's just drawing us into sin. Throw it out. Today, throw it out. If you can't manage it, it's too hot for you, you can't do it, admit it. Get rid of it. Otherwise, what are you doing? Do you really have the purpose of amendment? Do you really have this option of just taking a little bit of it and then worrying whether you're going to even make it home in your car because you might die and go to hell? What do you want to do? It's your choice. But based on a little choice like that, it can damn us forever. It's not worth it. Well, the other thing that he says is that we have to pray the rosary daily. Now, I know I've emphasized it. You've heard us priests say it over and over again. Are you praying your rosary? Sometimes I'll ask people in the confession, are you saying your rosary? We need to say our daily rosary. It's the only way with the help of Our Lady to focus on this narrow path. When we don't have access to all the sacraments every day. We don't even have a culture around us that's protecting us. We need the rosary. Our Lady of Fatima is wise. She told us such many, many times. So I'm going to read to you a quote of his. Aside from saying the rosary is important, he says we should split it up into little chunks. And I've told people that also. We need to split up our rosary. If we're not able to say it all, well, I can't say my rosary because I can't spend 10, 15 minutes, which is quite surprising. Well, I can't do that. Then split it up. 
do two in the morning when you wake up, one at lunchtime, one decade, and two more decades in the evening before you go to bed. It's done. And we receive so much back for, for spreading our prayer out through the whole day. And you'll find you pray more. So that's very important. He says, he goes so far as say, if you're not going to commit to the rosary, then you aren't serious about salvation. We know this. We are serious about the things we're really serious about. We really take serious. It doesn't matter what it is. We'll spend time on it. But we really take it serious. So he says, if you're not serious about the rosary, you're not serious about your salvation. I told you about the evil images. And that goes then, if we're saying the rosary, then there's something that happens to the soul whereby it's no longer attracted. If you're really praying well, it's no longer attracted to that garbage. And then lastly, we need to do a good examination of conscience. Now I know that's been part of this whole preparation of total consecration. First 12 days and then the first week, you're getting to know yourself. You're, you're laying up good examination of conscience. Who am I? What do I need to confess? What are my faults and my vices? Then, of course, hopefully you've been taking them to confession. You've been making good use of confession. That's great. Get rid of those sins. Make a good examination of conscience and go to confession ASAP. We need to make certain that we've always confessed our mortal sins so that we may be in a state of grace. The state of grace is critical. We will never change anything. We will never move forward. We will never gain heaven, certainly, without the state of grace. One other thing that I need to say, and it ties in with the Kyrie of ours, is how real the devil is. We have gone through some terrible years here in the church, a good 50 plus now. And even maybe before, people were starting to play around. What is this idea of the devil? How real is it? How real is hell? And then what we have are two extremes now. Those who are just bold over curious about anything they can see on an exorcism, anything they can see on some horror movie with the head twirls around, anything Hollywood about the devil. And that's just vain curiosity. And that's the devil's playground. The other extreme is he doesn't exist. He doesn't want you to even think he exists. Hell doesn't exist. We, are, we have been told this by many modern theologians. Wow, even men in the church don't believe there's a hell. Well, there's probably not a devil either. So what is it? Is it all one of these extremes? No. He does exist, and he is roaring as a wild lion, trying to devour us daily. He's a real enemy, and he knows what he's doing. That's why I say it's very important for you men to gain back your masculinity. The devil's going to tear you apart if you're a weakling. A weakling, he tears apart. He runs after you. Because you're running ahead of him. Like a panicked deer. And he's going to eat you up. What do you have to stop and say no to him? You have nothing. Your will is so weak. You have given in to these different sins. And he runs after you. Biting at you and barking at you like a dog. And you just run scared. You don't even know how to say, No, I'm in charge. That's terrible. So the devil is a reality. And so according to our author, and according to what I'm telling you now, we know it's true with the life of the carry of ours. <laughs> he battled the devil. He had strangest things happening to him. Why? Because he was entering by the power of God into the nest of the devil. This town of ours, the devil had control of after the revolution. He had it in a handbasket. They are all going if not all of them, most of them. And here comes a little curie of ours. By the providence of God, a nobody who God would make somebody who everybody else said, oh, that dumb priest? Oh, why don't you just sign him to that ours, which is out of nowhere. And the devil, even when the curie approached, he knew he was in trouble. The story goes that he tried many times to dissuade the curie of ours, even from entering the city. Because he knew that this man of God was coming in all humility and simplicity, and he was going to change ours. 
his nest of sin. The devil knows that. He knows it's true in our souls. He knows it's true in our families. He knows it's true in society. Look at us. And any one of us who comes along in humility and simplicity to do the work of God, the devil hates that. He's going to do anything he wants, and he can, to get rid of you. The devil is real, and he wants your soul. I have two quotes to help to drive this home. One is from St. Augustine, the other from Padre Pio. Not all, says St. Augustine, nor even a majority are saved. There are indeed many, if regarded by themselves, but they are few in comparison with the far larger number of those who shall be punished with the devil. Again, that's St. Augustine. Padre Pio says, The devil is like a mad dog, tied by a chain. Beyond the length of the chain, he cannot catch hold of anyone. And you, therefore, keep your distance. If you get too close, you will be caught. Remember the devil has only one door with which to enter into your soul. Maybe you know it already. It's called your will. It's the only, the only door, the only window by which the devil can get into you. It's your will. That's Padre Pio. I have a story that goes along with this quote of Padre Pio. Funny enough how it lines up. Just while I was on vacation, I was talking to some faithful and they were telling me about a big dog that they have on their property who likes to maul and eat the cats. But he's on a chain. And I suppose he has something like a 20 foot diameter. He can go all the way around on this chain. And no cat gets inside that circle. No rodent. And if they do, they're gone. They're dead. So what happens? His friend, Another little dog, well he's a big dog, a little dog who's on the freedom side of things is wandering around the yard grabbing cats and dragging them into the circle for the big dog. Quite ingenious. Working together. Who is this little dog for us in the spiritual life? Our Jezebel. Who's putting us within that circle? That little dog. Somebody else. Not so ominous, not so threatening. Oh, I can just stand right outside the circle. What do you know? Our little dog comes right up behind us, grabs us by the pant leg, or worse, pushes us into the circle, and we are able to be mauled by the devil. What is it then? What is that little dog that captures you, pulls you within contact, as Padre Pio says we should not? What brings you so close that he can grab you? I think it's electronic. I think it's a few other things, of course, too. But any young man right now in his honest, sober mind knows that one of the worst weaknesses is the weakness of the flesh. And whatever can bring me into that, he's need, every young man should draw a circle around himself and say, you know, outside of this or inside of this, I have trouble. Whatever way it goes, I don't know. But he should know where that limit is, where the devil will catch him. Now, certainly, we don't want to play. We want to stay far away from that line. Because if we dare to get close to it, even playing with fire a little bit, we risk losing our soul. It's not worth it. And then, lastly, concerning a quote. We need to defend ourselves, don't we? One of the first things, I, I don't have time to go into all the defense, but hardly you know it already. Avoid the line. Get rid of your Jezebels. Go to confession. Go to Mass. Say your rosary. That you know already. But here's a quote from Padre Pio again. Something by which we should take as a type of point to ruminate, to think about. Have courage and do not fear the assaults of the devil. Remember this forever. Remember this forever. It is a healthy sign if the devil shouts and roars around your conscience. 
since this shows that he is not inside your will. 